up, welcome to Build. I'm your host, Matt Forte, and we are here live at the Build Studio in New York City. I am so excited our next guest is back. He's a television host, media personality, author, blogger, and naturalist with the National Wildlife Federation. For as long as he can remember, he's been fascinated by our natural world, and he's here to share that wonder with the rest of us. Ladies and gentlemen, please make an appropriate amount of noise and welcome back to the show the great David Mizajewski. Perfect. What's up? How you doing, David? I'm hanging in there. I'm excited to be back. Oh, I'm so excited you're here. Real quick, just for our audience at home, uh, the enthusiasm level you're hearing is out of respect for our furry friends. Everyone here is thoroughly enjoying the fact that you're back with us, David. We're yes, so excited I'm, I'm actually here. perfectly happy if the applause is low, because okay. this is all about the animals. We want to keep them happy and comfortable, and too much noise can make it freak them out a little bit. So. Also, like on a personal level, it just sets the bar at the right level. You know, low expectations, <laughs> that way you can over-deliver. <laughs> it's an old sales trick, is what it is. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> David, um, it's so awesome to have you back. How have you been, man? What have you been up to? What's life like for David right I've, yeah. I've been great. You know, I'm just doing my thing. Yeah. I'm working for the National Wildlife Federation, getting the word out about how important wildlife conservation is, and hopefully inspiring people to want to join our, our mission and our cause to protect wildlife with all of my media appearances. So. For sure, for sure, yeah. man. You, nobody works harder than you when it comes to this world. I've, I've interviewed a lot of people from the world of conservation, and like you are always, you, you're always on. In fact, I wanted to thank you publicly. I have a screenshot of something earlier in the summer. If we can go to that really quick. I had come across <laughs> one of the most frightening things I'd ever seen in my entire life. Yeah. And I thought right away <laughs> after run uh, was, I got to tweet David. I got to see what he says. And I asked you about that. And, all, and this is all I sent you was this photo. And you came back. You identified for me <laughs> accurately, mind you, after we had somebody come in and take a look at it. You identified the species of, of bee. And, and you told me exactly what to do. It, it was incredible. So first of all, thank you. Anytime. And, and second of all, how annoying is it when people do this to you? I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, I wasn't going to say it, but yeah. um, no, I'm actually more than happy to field any wildlife ID questions and offer advice. Um, my family knows this well because like, they're <laughs> constantly texting and, and calling me with just this sort of thing. But, yeah. Yeah, if I can help people understand the natural world, I mean, that to me is what social media is for, right? Yeah, so 100%. Now I'm probably going to regret that when I leave here and I'm going to have a thousand, what is this? You know? What is this? I will say this, um, if it's really helpful, if people do need help with identification or advice yeah. like this, for me to know a little bit of information, like where the photo was taken, what you think it is. A lot of times I get like a blurry blob and it's like, what's this? <laughs> what and I'm like, I, I'm, I, I can't help you. you know? no, I'm not so, a magician. Yeah. Right. So, but yeah, it's actually a bald faced hornet, yeah. not a bee. Sorry, sorry. Be separate, separate group of insects. This is why you're They're here. related, you know, yeah. but um, you know, what's interesting um, in my neighborhood in Washington, DC, we actually had three of these just randomly in street trees. And I don't know what was up with them this year. They had a population boom or something, but yeah. I gotta tell you, I don't have another photo of this, but also unbeknownst to us at that same house on the television antenna on top, because we have an old school antenna uh -huh. up there, they found another one about that size. Yeah. Same exact yeah. thing. Now, you know, while we're on this, yeah, I just let's... wanna throw a little bit of love towards wasps and hornets. Yes, these animals can sting us, but if you follow the golden rule, and the golden rule is if you never try to you know, pick up, touch, pet, or harass a wild animal, your chances of being bitten, you. stung, yeah. you know, envenomated, or killed by the animal almost is zero. So as long as you leave these guys alone and don't yeah. go close to them, they're not gonna hurt you. And they're actually important predators. They actually keep true pest insects under control. I was reading that in the uh, the very informative link that you had sent yeah. along with your tweets. <laughs> I'm trying to see what I wrote here. Yeah. yeah, no, you wrote some good stuff. It was great. You told me exactly, uh, bald-faced hornet's nest, you had it right away, 10 to 12 feet from where you walk, that could be a danger zone. And sadly, the, both of them were right where people yeah. were at all times. We had to uh, do something about it. And that's okay to do. I mean, yeah. obviously, I, I actually had an encounter with yellow jackets in my own yard, oh, no. which is a, a National Wildlife Federation certified wildlife habitat garden, which everybody out there can do, by the way. It's super easy to do, but um, you know, I didn't want to go out there and start spraying pesticides. I had these yellow jackets, yeah. and I, the beginning of the summer, everything was fine, um, and then they, they got me, and a week later, they got me twice again, and then my arm like, got totally swollen, so Jeez. now I have to carry an EpiPen. So yes, even I had to then nuke those, those Yeah, you have to do something about it yeah. at some point. Yeah. 
Uh, let's go back a second. How does anybody get their garden? How, what, what do you mean anyone can do that? Anyone can do it. If you can plant something, whether you have a big suburban yard or you're even a rural property or you're in the middle of a city and you have some containers, if you plant things that provide basic elements of habitat for wildlife, food, yeah. and cover, and host plants for butterfly caterpillars and, and a water source, you will qualify to have that garden space become a certified wildlife habitat with the National Wildlife Federation. So, if, and it really it's just our way of thanking people for doing something good for wildlife. So many wildlife species can coexist with us, you know, in our cities and our towns and our neighborhoods and our yeah, yeah, yeah. birds and butterflies, like the monarch butterfly. Well, I wanna talk about yeah, that. Yeah, so, so this is, yeah, the monarch butterfly used to be super common. In the last 20 years or so, their population has plummeted by almost 90%. And oh one God. of the big reasons for that is what I was just saying, their caterpillar host plant um, is being eliminated. Hmm. Monarch butterflies can only lay their eggs on milkweed. And there's a bunch of different milkweeds that are native across North America. A lot of them are found in kind of like the middle part of the country where agriculture is huge. And due to a variety of reasons, we're getting better at eliminating the milkweed. Um, same time, everybody in our yards, we're becoming more obsessed with having that pristine lawn, right, spraying right. pesticides everywhere. And as a result, these once iconic, or these once common iconic butterflies, they've nosedived. And the cool thing about the monarch, the plight of the monarch, if you could say there's any cool thing about it, is that this is an opportunity for individuals in their own personal like space, the own, their own little piece of their earth, their backyards or their gardens, can actually do something to save a species and prevent it from you know, getting to the point where it's gonna be an endangered species. You know, I can't save a polar bear in my backyard, but I can save monarch butterflies in my backyard. Well, first of all, I wanna go back to that polar bear thing in a second, because uh, <laughs> you could do anything, David. <laughs> but but um, so we, over 20 years, is that what you said? Yeah. So this literally, this really is one of those things. Uh, often we look back and think, oh, I was just a kid. But I often think, I feel like I used to see a lot more, but yeah. butterflies were a bigger thing when I was a kid, yeah. and they were more, they were, they were more abundant, yeah. and there were more of them around. One, that's sad and scary. Mm -hmm. uh, two, so you talked about the, is this at all linked uh, to the uh, similar decrease in bee population, the honeybee population? Are they, are they together or is it just two separate but equally important issues? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's all related in yeah. that they, these are all things that are happening because of what we human beings are doing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, with a honeybee, you're talking about colony collapse disorder. Yeah. There's a whole bunch of things that, that kind of uh, build up that can contribute to why that's happening. Uh, most people don't know that honeybees aren't really a wild species. They're really a domesticated species, kind of like a cow. And so their plight is really an agricultural issue because yeah. they provide pollination services and honey and things like that. At the same time, we've got 4,000 wild native bee species here in North America many of which we have no clue what their populations are because they're just not being studied. Yeah. Um, some of them we know are plummeting, like the, the rusty-patched bumblebee, first North American bee species to be listed as endangered. Used to be super common, just like the monarch butterfly, but again, because of habitat destruction, people spraying pesticides, too many lawns, getting yeah. rid of native plants, paving everything over, you know, big agriculture spraying pesticides everywhere. Um, you know, these things, I mean, it's, it's simple math if yeah. you have you know, wildlife needs habitat. If you take away the habitat, the wildlife goes away. And unfortunately, or, or fortunately, I should say, there's a lot of things that we, again, as individual citizens can do to help species like the bees, like the butterflies, migratory songbirds, um, local amphibian populations. Amphibians are the group of wildlife that um, is, is disappearing faster than any other really? group. I think a full third of amphibian species are, are imperiled with extinction right now. Um, you know, stop putting chemicals on your lawn, you know, have a little frog pond in your backyard, work locally to protect your local wetlands, and we can turn the tide, at least locally, for some of these amphibian species. That's pretty, I had no idea the amphibians were under yeah. crisis as well. It's a big problem. I could keep going on with the bad news. No, but. I know, well, that, you know, but you kind of have to right now, right? Yeah. Like, of course, we're gonna have a lot of fun. The second half of this segment's gonna be uh, all kinds of hugs and cuddles, but, uh, these are real things that are going yeah. on, and it's important that you get to talk about these things. I enjoy talking about them. I like being informed. Yeah. Um, you know, to that end, when you talk about the things that we can do, we can build little frog ponds. We can we can have a certified garden and all right. that sort of stuff. How much of your mission lately has become motivating people not only to do that, mm -hmm. but to call your your local representatives and get involved politically. I feel like that's become more of it now too because yeah. the, the backyard things we can do, but we also have to do large scale things. A hundred percent, yeah. I mean, personal actions are important and we should all be doing them. Um, but in order for them to have impact, we need like 
hundreds of millions of people doing them. Yeah. And, um, and in some cases we are. Um, but the fact of the matter is the biggest way that we can have an impact on protecting wildlife and making sure we have a healthy planet for all of us to live on is at the top level yeah. policy change, making sure we have strong environmental laws, making sure we have um, you know, strong wildlife protection laws so that we kind of institutionalize conservation instead yeah. of leaving it up to you know, people just deciding today, oh, I'm gonna do this or that. Um, and the National Wildlife Federation works on both ends of that spectrum. Yeah. So we have, um, you know, we do a lot of work in Washington D.C. where where I'm based, um, and that's what we're doing behind the scenes. You know, we we're not out there necessarily, um, yeah. you know, shouting from the rooftops and trying to take credit for all this. But my colleagues out, are out there every day, you know, doing the political thing in D.C., trying to um, move some of. The, you know these the, the good things forward and fight the bad things that are going to hurt wildlife. Um, at the same time, you know we're all about introducing the next generation of of kids out there to wildlife. We publish Ranger Rick magazine. Mm. Um, we um, also are publishing Zoo Books magazines. I grew up reading these things. Wait by a second, the way. you guys are Zoo Books? Too? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wait, did, did, did everybody remember Zoo Books? I see a bunch <laughs> of nods. Yeah. I loved Zoo Books. Yeah. The commercial for I had no idea. Yeah. So, um, you know that's Zoo Books. That's. If, for folks, if you're not familiar with the National Wildlife Federation, we're America's conservation organization. Yeah. We focus here in North America. Um, we do some international work as well. But um, and again, we have we do all of the you know the hard policy oriented work yeah. that's necessary. But we also really want to engage people. We're about people as well, in, in in particular kids, and making sure that we're kind of creating the next generation of people who actually care about wildlife. Yeah, yeah. Um, so. Yeah, I was reading, uh, and um, thank you for that, because I was looking at the NWF website, and I was, I was surprised that uh, even today, there's stuff going on this very moment. There was something at 2 o'clock uh, about people uh, trying to modify the Endangered Species Act and all this mm -hmm. sort of thing. I was fascinated that I was completely ignorant to all of this yeah. until I went to the site and started yeah. getting informed. So I was curious, because I, I know the fun side of your job. I'm wonder I was curious about what the other side of that job is like, and it sounds like you guys are, are really out there hitting the pavement. Yeah, the absolutely. Camp. I mean, you know, I'll be honest, I have a degree in political science yeah. and ecology, because I originally thought I was going to, you know, get involved on the ad advocacy side of things. Yeah. And, you know, as sometimes happens as we are learning and growing and figuring out what uh, we want to do in our career, um, I realized fairly early on that um, I honestly was just not particularly well suited to that branch of conservation, which is critically important. Yeah. But um, I got really lucky um, after, you know, having a panic attack about wasting hundreds of thousands <laughs> of my parents' money on this. As everyone degrees, who right? went to college um, has had. My yes. first job out of school was as a summer camp naturalist at a nature center. And the very first thing that I learned was how to handle wildlife and present them to the public to inspire people and share all of this geeky knowledge that I have about animals yeah. and nature and come at it from the other way. And that's why, you know, at the National Wildlife Federation, like, it's such a perfect fit for me because we do both of those things. Yeah. And I'm lucky, as you said, that I get to focus on some of the more positive things, but um, all the other work is critically important. And I will say this, too. We cannot do our work to protect wildlife without everybody getting involved. Mm -hmm. um, and there's so many ways to get involved. You know, you mentioned getting involved on the, uh, on the advocacy side, you know, mm -hmm. calling your representatives, voting for yeah. sure. Um, if that's your inclination, you know, we have ways that you can hook up with us to do that. Um, not everybody's into that, and you know, some people want to make a difference on that local level. That's where we get into our Garden for Wildlife program, yeah, the yeah. Certified Habitats. Um, following us on social media. You know, Great. sharing our messages with your network Huge is a powerful way that people can get involved at a very simple, very easy, very basic level. Um, and hopefully, you know, folks will want to join us and become members yeah. um, and fund our work so that we can continue fighting for wildlife. There's also a lot of great stuff, too, uh, if you want something really immediate, especially after some of the little characters we're going to meet today on uh, the NWF site. Uh, you can adopt, uh, what's the word that, that's not? Symbolically adopt. Symbolically yep. adopt. Yep. Yeah, you can symbolically adopt. And there's a lot of great stuff you get when you symbolically adopt. Totally. You know? I mean, it's, if you, it's a really fun thing to do. If you are into stuffed animals, yeah. um, you know, as a little thank you, if you want to uh, symbolically adopt any one of a few dozen wildlife species, um, you can do that and you can opt and we'll send you a little yeah. plush animal and that you can have that as a reminder that, you know, you're, again, doing something really important and that's making a financial contribution to a conservation Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And you get a cool little plush. Yeah. Um, well, that's a perfect segue into the second half of this. Talking about how when you found this was something you were really good at, really comfortable at. Let's 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 get into it, man. We've got some friends with us today. That's I right. don't know the order they're going to come out in. I think you at least know the first one. I know you? the first one. So yeah. do you want to set it up or you want to bring it right on out? Yeah, let's bring it on out. This is one of my favorite kinds of animals. Oh, sweet Mary. All right. 
Do you want to help me hang on to this guy? Should I come you, over there? No, you can. You want me to just? Yeah, you can just do that. Oh, oh, okay. And whoop, we had a little bit of a step problem over there, but I think we're good. Okay. Um, all right. So you obviously know that this is a snake. Do you David, know? What, David, it's looking at me. Do you, well, if you were another snake, you would actually be in trouble. Okay. Um, this is a king snake, and king snakes get their name in part because. One of the foods that they like to eat are other snakes. Fair so enough. So this is a species of snake that actually can take on rattlesnakes no. and um, and is happy happy to chow on them. And you know, like most snakes, they don't chew their food. They open their jaw and they just kind of swallow and use that muscle action Unreal. to uh, the to power. shimmy it down. Yeah, and so that's partly why I wanted you to hold it because number one, tell me, is this a slimy Dave. animal? No, it's not, but okay. David, what's happening with my left hand? It's it, is, it is coiled around it's me. It's just hanging on. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you're fine, you're fine. Um, so most people think snakes are slimy, right? No, he's not slimy at not all. Not at all. It's actually very smooth, dry, leather-like. Yeah. Um, and so I just wanted to dispel that, that myth there. Um, Got it. Now, here's the thing. A lot <laughs> of people on. are terrified of snakes, right? Yeah, well, no, I'm good. <laughs> Uh, you're very brave. I'm <laughs> thanks, actually thanks, I'm, I'm proud of you. You want to, get, you want to No, I'm it? good. Yeah, it's getting okay. tighter. I'm learning. I'm pushing through. Yeah. This is how you learn. Go um, on. Almost 100% of snakes are 100% harmless to people. Okay. Right? The almost so, is concerning. Well, right. This one is not one that could put, that is venomous or anything okay. like that. Okay. So, but I, I say that because th this is a group of animals that is severely maligned. Um, I'm sure we've all heard the only good snake is a dead snake, right? Um, that's just flat out ignorance. Yeah. These are important animals, they're important predators of other snakes, of rodents, um, even insects. Some snakes feed on insects. They also, there's some new research out, and in fact there's a story on it in the latest issue of National Wildlife Magazine on the a surprising role that snakes play. Snakes that eat rodents actually, um, we're finding out, are really important as um, distributors of plant seeds. Because rodents, many species, eat plants, plants. and seeds. And they when the eat snake the eats the rodent, um, all of that goes through the snake's digestive tract. And the snake actually can help disperse the seeds of plants and actually contribute to the healthy plant community That's crazy, that man. all other wildlife species rely on. So I just want to give a shout out for how cool snakes are. And I mean, number one, it's beautiful. It's beneficial. Absolutely. If a snake encounters a human being in the wild, it is afraid of you. It is going to try to hide from you. It's gonna rely on its camouflage. If you get too close, it's gonna give you a warning. Yeah. It's gonna rattle its tail, it's gonna hiss, right? These are not animals that wanna come after you or hurt you. So again, if you follow the golden rule that I mentioned before, yes. if you encounter a snake in the wild, people always ask me this, what should I do? And I say, smile, it's pretty awesome. Yeah. Take a step back, don't get close to it, don't try to take a selfie with it, yeah. right? But count it as a really awesome wildlife encounter. And it's a really good thing if snakes are around. It shows that the ecosystem is healthy. Well, I, I certainly feel a little bit better after all of that. And yeah. uh, through holding, does this snake have a name? Or is it just? You know, I don't know what the snake's name is. Do we know if this snake has a name? Uh, Fred. Fred? Okay. Did you just make that up? <laughs> 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 all right, so Fred, Fred the King is, Snake. That, Fred well, he's, the King he's Snake, Fred though. Now, yeah. Uh, yeah, there are certain things that I would only experience if it wasn't for, I mean, like the, the, the amount of power just in how it's moving yeah. around and coiling around. It is a beautiful animal, yeah. and, and it, it really is a lot less scary when I've had a moment to kind of adjust and get out of my own head about it. Yeah. Uh, it was really nice to meet Fred. Uh, tell <laughs> right. me there's something else. Yes, we, have, we, we do have some cute furry animals, so. As let's, well. Uh, let's bring out our next animal here. Can I say bye to now, Fred? This is also one of my favorite species. Oh, look at this little buddy. So this is... David, can I join you on the couch? Can I? Can uh, I is, that, is that okay? Is, this, yeah. is that safe? Is that? <laughs> yeah. No. Put the possum here. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna come on over. Whoop whoop. All right. Oh, I see. We have a banana. You know what, David? I'm gonna stay in the yeah. chair, <laughs> if you don't mind. All right. I'm gonna. You got her, Jamie. Yep. Got <laughs> I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna. So this is. So talk to me about what's going on here, David, because what's happening here is, is oh boy, look so, at that. Who's Fred's little buddy? All right, this is a Virginia opossum, and this is actually a really great example of why you should not approach wildlife. Now, this is Me an orphan. Me specifically or people in general? People in general. Got it. This is an right. orphaned animal that oh, um, baby. my friend Jamie here is, you know, has. <laughs> I hated the rug anyway, don't worry. Has Go on. hand raised, right? But even a hand raised animal, wild animal, it's still a wild still animal. Still a wild None animal. None of these animals are pets. And so these are animals that um, you know would die if they were left out in the wild. So 
you know, Jamie and Grant here are, you know, tasked with taking care of it. And so, again, even a hand-raised animal, when yeah. she got a little bit spooked there in that handoff, and, you know, that, that can happen. So luckily, you know, she didn't get me, and I, we're all I, good. I but. mean, I could not blame her more. Yeah. You know, I mean, think of, <laughs> first of all, an orphaned animal right. in a completely alien environment. Yeah. Naturally, she got a little spooked. Right. Uh, still yeah. a beautiful creature. Right, and so I do want to just give a little love. I know you're all terrified of possums now, but possums also, <laughs> really cool animals. Um, some new research is showing that they can actually help control tick populations. Ooh. So one opossum in one sort of uh, spring, summer season can consume up to 5,000 ticks, taking them out of the ecosystem. Wow. That's a huge benefit. And it's because even though they look kind of gross and dirty, they're very fastidious. They groom themselves, and when they get ticks on them, they just consume them. They're much cleaner animals than, say, like a raccoon or a skunk or something like that. Um, they also are, uh, they eat venomous snakes. So if you don't like the snakes, having possums around is actually kind of a good thing. So they're not rodents. So again, I, in, I implore everybody out there, if you see a possum, it's a good thing. Give it a yeah. little bit of love. Don't try to touch it because they have a lot of teeth in their mouth. They yeah. have a lot of teeth. So, all right, let's bring all right, what are we? What's, what's up next? Right, now everyone's gonna love this guy and I think you're all gonna know what it is. And we're gonna let him, you, just ha you want me to? I'm just gonna let him here. You want me to hang on to him? I'm gonna let you come break. <laughs> so all of these animals are very clingy. There you go. All right. Uh, just give him treats. There we go. On right, a scale of one to <laughs> 10, should I or should I not come over to the couch? You probably shouldn't, because even though this is a two-toed sloth, everyone, in case you uh, Look at them didn't go. know. Even an animal like this, the, I was telling you backstage, yeah. um, sloths are, are herbivores. Sometimes they'll eat insects and things like that, <laughs> but um, they do have very sharp front teeth. Yes. And so, again, even though this guy is you know, hand-raised, um, he's still a wild animal. He's not domesticated. At and all. so they still have their natural instinct to kind of you know, use those teeth if they get a little bit spooked. And that's Got why it. we're just kind of letting him sit here and do his thing, right? So, <laughs> you didn't look at it. Let me see if- we'll, What else we'll, you got in the bag, we'll David? He is not thrilled. What did I give him? I gave him a little zucchini. Well, let's see if he takes it. He's gonna try it again, but he doesn't know he has options. I'm gonna give him a grape here. Give him a grape. What's his name? Because a grape- uh, What do you got on this one? This is- Artemis? Yes. That one he didn't make up. No, that's actually <laughs> really his name. <laughs> So a two-toed sloth, um, there are two-toed sloths, there's three-toed sloths. Um, it's talking about the number of claws yeah, on the yeah, front yeah, foot. Yeah. What if you could see that? the back foot, the back foot actually has three. But these guys live So in, he's a five-toed then. Uh, well, <laughs> it goes by the front feet, so two. <laughs> but um, they live down in the, the tropical forests of uh, Central and South America. Quick, he's getting away. Actually, I mean, he's cool to just wander. <laughs> we're, we're gonna, look, you, look you could, this is actually, Wait, I'm, 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 glad, I'm glad he's doing this, okay? Me so too. These, these are animals that are adapted for life in the trees, right? Okay. So they typically are hanging upside down. We've all seen you know, photos and, and uh, video the of them. Does the banana pose any threat? No, he's actually gonna go and try to eat the banana, I think. Fantastic, and, let him um, have at it. And so, so they're not adapted to really move well on the ground. Poor and you thing. can see how awkward, right? Yeah, super awkward. It's kind awkward. of like, you know, so they almost never come down from the trees. They want to live in a forested environment where they can go from branch to branch. Yeah. Um, they do actually come down to the, the ground once a week to go to the bathroom. Now, what? they have incredibly slow metabolisms. You know, they're eating fairly low, uh, low nutrient foods. You know, again, a lot of the plant material that they're eating isn't nutrient dense, right? Yeah. So they eat a lot of it and they have a slow metabolism, and once a week they have to poop, and they'll come once down. Once a week. And they'll poop at the bottom of the tree, which actually helps then fertilize the tree. Fair enough. So it's a nice little ecosystem symbiosis. But, um, you know, sloths are weird animals. I mean, just look at it, right? <laughs> I mean, if you think about how it has evolved to hang upside down, e even its internal organs are positioned differently than an animal that is terrestrial, right. because it's, you know, evolved to hang upside down. So the organs are all separated. Um, just really weird, crazy animals that remind me of how amazing the animal life on this planet is. I mean, if you can think it For up, sure. there's an animal that it's evolved to, to sort Over of, years. to do it. To do um, it. You know, we think about science fiction and, and, and you know, all the creatures from Star Wars. And <laughs> you know, I'm a big geek with that too, but I also, uh, you know, again, when I see an animal like a sloth here, I it's a reminder that we don't even need to make things up. They're here. You know, they're here, yeah. living, breathing, mm -hmm. bizarre, Strange animals. You said uh, once a week? Yeah, only is once that, a week. Is that pretty regular, or is there, like, are we? <laughs> well, I just, does it typically yeah. happen on a Wednesday? Yeah. Like, what time, are it's, we in danger right, right now? No, we're, we, not, we're not in danger. So he, we, yeah, so you see, he's already kind of orienting uh, the other way, upside down. My goodness. <laughs> 
But it doesn't get cuter, right? No, it doesn't. Um, it but doesn't. Again, should, look at his little face. N not a pet. Oh um, my God, like, I, like I've been saying, let's see if he'll oh, take a grape up. over here. Yeah, he'll take, oh, he... Does he want the grape? Bring it closer, bring it closer. There he's letting go. you know, yeah. There we go. <laughs> oh, already. No, see, he's not, he's not hanging on. So we're just gonna let him hang there. No, he can, um, but... I mean, he's kind of, he's getting into the microfibers on the couch, man. He's digging it. He's comfy is what he is. Well, you know, he's it, lounging like an old timey, look like, a, like yeah. an emperor. If he actually lived in the wild, <laughs> his, his fur might take on the same color as this. No. Sofa because they are so slow moving and they live in these humid tropical forests that algae actually grows in their fur. And it, 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 it actually provides a little bit of camouflage for them when they're up yeah. in the treetops. Because unfortunately, as cute as this guy is, he is on the menu for certain other... My <laughs> kingdom for a grape! <laughs> certain other, <laughs> other wildlife species. Oh my God. No, you don't want that? There we go. <laughs> Thank you. And, <laughs> Can, so, can somebody want to come up here and fan him? Can we? <laughs> like a giant palm leave or something, perhaps? Well, you know, look, you can see how dexterous those claws are, too. He's actually oh my able God, to he's hold, on, yeah. hold on to that grape and, and take a bite. He kind of rejected it at first because it wasn't cut in half for him. Yeah. And so he was, like, looking <laughs> yeah. for And so, I, you know, I made him do a little bit of work there. But, um, yeah, unfortunately, these guys are in nature, so they're, they're prey items for things like jaguars or harpy eagles, so that yeah. that, um, that mo uh, algae that grows in their fur Helps gives them a little bit of added camouflage. camouflage. And also, again, just their slow moving and the fact that they don't come down to the ground. So, yeah. Um, all right. Unbelievable. We've well, got a few more really cool animals that I want to get to. <laughs> For sure. So. I was going to say we could hang out with Artemis all day. All right. But Why don't we've we got to say out? goodbye, a slow and tearful goodbye. <laughs> Bye, Artemis. <laughs> Oh, right. goodness gracious. Now, this one I'm fairly certain I can come sit with you for. Is yeah, that... why don't you come on over here and you can here meet go. little All Nellie. Right. This is Nellie the kangaroo. Nellie, what is up? Now, you'll notice she's in a bag. She certainly is. And it's a pouch, you know, David. It's a, well, it's, no, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pouch simulation, right? <laughs> so she is a kangaroo, and kangaroos are marsupials. Yeah. Um, the opossum was a marsupial too. So both of those animals were born basically as almost embryos. Yes. Little tiny, very underdeveloped, um, you know, fetuses almost, right? So they had no fur. They didn't have back legs. They really didn't have any eyes yet. They were just these little bean-shaped things. And um, with marsupials, which are mammals, they don't have placentas. Mm -hmm. So for placental mammals, um, you know, dogs, cats, humans, right? We, you know, we grow inside of our mother for nine months and we you know, get our nutrients yeah. from the placenta. Well, marsupials don't have that. So they kind of develop externally. They're born, again, very premature, and through scent, they find their way into the mother's pouch, and they attach themselves to the nipple in there, and then they spend another X number of months, depending on the species, wow. growing and developing. And so she's about six months old, six months. and that's about the time when they start to kind of want to explore outside of the pouch. So I was gonna ask, if that, how, yeah. how do you get so well, Nelly she in she the outside world here. Well, you kind of just do it slowly, right? Yeah. And she's not really quite, you know, comfortable out in the real world. She likes to be in the pouch, but you could see she's poking her head out and yeah. she's exploring. But you know, for a baby kangaroo, um, you know, like they're perfectly happy to just kind of sit and observe Look for a at while. Her little claws. Yeah, when she gets a little bit older, she'll, um, you know, she'll be able to hop around and. Yeah. You know, and, and explore and that kind of thing. But she'll still always want to go back into the pouch, she's right, sweetie? She's always going to want to be in the pouch. She's giving you a king yes, of root I, know. I mean, it doesn't get cuter than this, does it? Oh, my right, sweetie. gosh. What do you smell? <laughs> oh, goodness. So, may, I, may I? Yes, yeah, so you can pet her. Yeah, she's... Um, so, yeah, I mean, kangaroos, they're... <laughs> Nelly, we good? Their, their mouths are filled with fangs. No, no they're, they're not. <laughs> they're, they're herbivores. They're grazers. Um, they, I think everybody knows they, they live in Australia. Yeah. And um, they kind of fill the same ecological niche that um, in other parts of the world deer do. I was talking about this downstairs. Yeah. Some, uh, my buddy Brad works on the show, executive producer here. He was saying he's been to Australia. Mm -hmm. They're everywhere. Yeah. And as he was describing them, I was like, oh, my gosh, they sound like yeah. a much cooler version of deer. Well, you know, if you think about, um, you know, Australia is very far away from other land masses, and, and, and it's essentially a giant island, right? And in yeah. island ecosystems, oftentimes you get um, very unique animals that evolve because they, have, they, they don't have a, the predators that are present on the mainland or there's a resource on that island. Island. Um, and so, you know, that's why the life in Australia is so very different than many other parts of the world, because they evolved in isolation. But the cool thing is, is that 
you know, this, this sort of idea of convergent evolution where <laughs> animals, <laughs> and I'm getting all sciencey here on you, but no, it's where, fine. where species, focusing. completely unrelated species in completely different parts of the world evolve to take advantage of the same kind of resources. So, you know, even if you look at her face, yeah. there's something slightly deer-like about deer it, right? There's something deer-esque, yes. And so, um, but yeah, they, they're, they're, they're herbivores, they're, they're grazers, um, so and, you know, there are no deer in Australia, not native anyway, and so, you yeah. know, it's just taking advantage of, of resources. What do you got going she's on back eating, there? She's got your little bungee yeah. over here. She's, she's, she's just kind of getting that. curious and exploring. Um, so yeah, I mean, in the wild, she'd live in a, in a um, you know, a family group yeah. of, uh, oh, oh, she's, she's coming out. Can I put her on the ground? I was gonna would say, okay? what would happen? No, okay. no, no, yeah, we, we, we don't would never see her again. All right, no. let me, yeah. let's, all right, mom, help me. <laughs> <laughs> we got her in here. There we go. Oh, Let's just get her hard. in there, yeah. No, let, <laughs> she's she's in the back. Yeah, let, let, I'll hang on to her for another second. We'll see if she pokes her head out is again. This a, uh, this is a custom design. Yeah, there we go. Pouch there we go. bag situation. This is, you had to, this is like made for this purpose. No, it's not made for this purpose, no? but it works nicely for this purpose, yeah. So, you know, again, she's, she's comfortable being in the pouch. She um, loves it. Again, she's old enough, to, she, she just got a little bit curious and wanted to come out, but um, there's a lip here for, if you couldn't tell, we don't want her yeah, to Yeah, we don't want her to fall edge, off so. the edge of the stage. Um, and now she's like, I'm done. Yeah, <laughs> I get that. You denied her the one thing she requested. We were feeding already grapes for days, yeah. and here Nellie can't All right, jump out. Let's, we have a few more left, yeah, let's, right? I want to get to our next couple of animals. Yeah, and this one you can stay on the sofa for as well. I'm going to pass little Nellie off. Um, since you did so well before, Yes. we're going to bring out a Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Is it larger? Somebody no, tell actually, me if it's larger. It's well, it's a little bit um, thicker of a snake. The other, the king snake is like a fairly that. thin, skinny snake. This is a rainbow boa. <laughs> now, this snake will actually get what larger. The hell, man? This will get larger than the king snake. But right. Um, right. this is a uh, another um, South American species, not venomous. Okay, that so, helps. Again, if looking this was, right at me. Though, if this bro. was a venomous snake, I would not be handling it. But um, these guys are beautiful. Look at the color on this. Look Without at the question. Yeah? Yes. And. Um, you know, there's, there's, they actually come in a variety of colors, uh, wide variation, but um, that's why they're called rainbow boas because they can have lots of different colors and it's a sheen. You can touch it. Should, yeah, should, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna... um, and so um, this species is a constrictor. Um, like, it sure is. Yeah. Oh and, boy. <laughs> and they use the, you know, this muscular body to overwhelm oh, prey like birds and rodents. Uh, um, and wow. we used to think that Whoa. constrictors, yeah, <laughs> yeah. you're getting a feel for it. Yeah, he's yeah, now, super... he's really just, He's just trying to have, you know, feel just secure. Hang on? Yeah, okay, his, cool. Got yeah, it. Well, he wants to have his body supported. So, okay. um, but yeah, so we used to think that um, they strangled their prey through constriction. I can believe that. right, but really, really, what happens is it's a little bit more gruesome, but also maybe maybe slightly more humane. What happens is they are so strong that they exert such pressure as they're constricting around their prey that it actually causes organ failure. No. Yeah. So it's kind of like. After you know a, a few seconds, your organs just shut down and you die. Uh, uh, not you. You're gonna be fine. You're, he's gonna wait. ask if he tends to yeah. start with the wrist by chance. <laughs> now, if you were something like the size of a mouse or a rat, you'd Fair be in enough. trouble. But no. um, but yeah, at any rate. Um, so I think it's a little bit more um, maybe humane because you go faster that way versus suffocating, which is not really a pleasant way to go. Unreal. Um, it takes a lot longer, I guess. Um, yeah, yeah, so yeah, I mean, again, a beautiful, beautiful animal. Oh, one other myth I like to dispel about snakes that we all learn in, you know, when we're kids in kindergarten is that that snake, its tongue, it's gonna sting you or it's gonna, oh. it's gonna you know, bite you and get you, give you venom through it. No, not at all. Um, do you know what the snake's tongue is doing? I was gonna say, doesn't it smell through its yes. tongue? Exactly. I thought you were about to tell me that was the myth, and I was yeah. like, that's all I ever knew, was that they <laughs> smell through their tongue and I should stay away. No, that's, well, see, you, you, your information is accurate. Yeah. So whoever told you that, uh, they, they did you a service. Yeah. So the, Westchester the, Public School System there right there for you, everybody. That's the, what that is. The tongue is not dangerous. It's simply a way that the snake is gathering information about its environment. So, you know, if you think about it, you know, if you touch your, your tongue to the roof of your mouth, okay. right, what's in your head right above the roof of your mouth? Nose. Right. So your, oh, your yeah. taste, your sense of taste in human nice. beings and scent are actually really closely related. Got well, it's it. the same thing. So the snake is flicking its tongue out and it's gathering little scent particles out of the air. And when it pulls the tongue back in, of course, they never want to face the camera. Let no. me do this. this I want yeah. everybody to see the beautiful face on this animal. So when they pull their tongue back in their mouth, all of those uh, scent particles brush there against the roof of the mouth where there's an, a scent organ there. 
Wow. And so that's that's all it's doing. It's just trying to uh, you know explore its environment and figure out you know what's going on. Is there danger out there? Is there food out there? So um, yeah, beautiful, beautiful animal. People, wow. um, you know, again, give these animals a really bad rap, but. Um, they're important and they're beautiful. And even if they do freak you out, that's okay. You know, just because something's scary yeah. or something's ugly. I mean, same thing with the possums. They're not um, the cutest animals out there. But it doesn't mean that they're not important and that they don't deserve our respect or our protection. 100%. You were uh, talking about myths and things of that nature earlier and saying that a majority of the snakes are not right. uh, pose a danger to humans. Yeah. Is there another myth I remember as a kid is like, oh, that one has this marking on its head or you look for that. Is that really specific to types of snakes or is there? Yeah, I mean, the, you, you hear general. Like certain um, colors. Yeah general, yeah, general things like, you know, if it's got a triangular head, right. it's venomous. Um, you know, no, there's no foolproof rule that there, for which there's not an exception. Um, in North America, most of our venomous snakes do have that very triangular shaped head. Um, and uh, there is the coral snake, though, that doesn't. Yeah. So uh, it's not 100% foolproof. What I always tell people is if you're going to be going hiking or camping um, or living out in a rural area, it's very simple to do a little bit of research. You know, the Internet can be your friend. It's not even like you have to go to the library like in the old days. <laughs> Just look up, like, what are the snakes in my area? Yeah. You know, a, a, an ounce of knowledge is, goes a really long way. I mean... If you can identify what the potentially venomous snakes are in your area, then you'll know what to look for. And if you see a non-venomous one, well, then you know that you don't have to get, grab the shovel and bash it over the head, which unfortunately is what people do. And so many harmless and really beneficial snakes get killed every year killed because, because people do that. They do that. You know? So, all right. Why don't we go on to our next animal? All right, buddy. Uh, all right, watch. Yep. Yeah. There we go. That's... All right. Gorgeous. This little one. Absolutely gorgeous animal. Oh, goodness. All right, let's. It's going to be okay? Yeah. All right. So I'm just going to sit back and let this little guy hang. Do you know what it is? I, that's, a, <laughs> that's a baby porcupine. That's it what is. That is. It's a baby African crested porcupine. Well, and you can see, it, even as babies, they've, they're equipped with a whole bunch of quills on oh, the Oh, they're back. going up. Yeah, they're still, they're not quite, you know, really, really sharp yet. So we're okay. But, um, word for it, Dave. but when this animal gets to be an adult, and these get fairly large, they, um, you know, porcupines are some of the largest rodent species that we have, and this animal can get to be 40, 50, 60 pounds. Wow. Yeah, so when, it, when it's full grown. And so um, those quills, this, uh, uh, this species of porcupine has the longest quills. They can be, you know, over a foot or longer. Get out of here. And, um, you know, we're, we're dispelling myths, so the big myth about porcupines is that they can flick their, um, or shoot their shoot quills em. out. Launch them. Yeah, and that's actually not true. Okay. What they do is, you know, you can see how they kind of point backwards, right? So if a predator, in the case of this guy in the wild, it would be something like a leopard okay. or a lion um, or a hyena comes for them. What it's going to do is twist around backwards and kind of swing its tail. And He's making a rattling noise. Yeah, he's just, he's kind of stimulated here. He's like, what's okay. going on? Okay. Um, so I thought you were about to say, that means he's poised for a test. No, 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 no. He's, uh, he, no, don't nibble my finger. They have, they're rodents, so they have really big rodent teeth. Yeah, I know, so he's kind of cute. Yeah, he's adorable, right? If you, look at his, if you look at his face, um, kind of looks like a guinea pig almost. Yeah. Which is also sure. a rodent. But, um, yeah, so what they do is they, they turn around you and they'll- You guys hear that? they will um, you know, swing their back end. And that okay. has given people this impression that they're trying to flick their quills, but yeah. you know, they can't do that. And, uh, but it's, it, you know, it's an effective way. I mean, the, this is an animal that in theory could kill a lion. Not because it's gonna bite it or maul it or anything like that, but if a lion, you know, a foolish on. lion comes after one of these guys and gets a mouthful of quills, well, Done. yeah, I mean, they, it can't eat after can't that. Eat. Yeah. yeah, and it's not like you know, an animal like a lion has a, um, has a hand to pluck the quills out. Right. So, you know, if you're an African predator, you have to be really careful if you're gonna try to take on one of these. Now, certainly some animals are able to get around the quills or flip them over to their soft underside and get a meal. But for the most part, um, it's a pretty good defense. And there's porcupine species all around the world. Again, this is the African species. There's also a population in Italy, mm -hmm. um, the only porcupine species um, found in Europe. Um, here in North America, we have the North American porcupine. Yeah. Um, and they look kind of similar, but they're, oh, um, hey. their quills aren't quite as long. And they're a lot more arboreal. This is a species that lives on the ground, and they dig burrows. Got it. Our North American porcupine, he's chewing on my button. Um, they like to hang out in the trees. But um, these guys are herbivores. 
Um, you know, they're eating plant material and um, yeah, they're just, they're cute, right? <laughs> they're super cute. I read somewhere you could identify the Italian ones because they talk with their hands. <laughs> I, uh, I want to turn, thank you. I want to turn it over. Is that our last little buddy before we? Yeah, this is our last event, little buddy. Right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, they, those are, those are up. What is, we're good though. I'll hang on to them for a second. You got them for a yeah. second? I see a couple of microphones out there uh, right in the front row. So let's start with, with some of our questions really quick before we wrap things up. Uh, yeah, go for it. Stand. I was waiting for the camera to not be over your head. Go for it. Uh, thank you for bringing the animals. Yeah. Um, you do a lot of these appearances, obviously. And uh, what's a really embarrassing incident you've <laughs> had with an yeah. animal? Oh, gosh. Um, an embarrassing one. Probably, um, I mean, I get peed and pooped on all the time. So I, there's not one specific incident where that has happened, but um, I always joke and say, it's not a good segment until somebody goes to the bathroom on me. <laughs> um, you know, because especially with little guys like this, in fact, I'm kind of surprised with all these babies that somebody hasn't gone on me. But, um, you know, animals, they're, again, they're wild animals. They're not house trained like pets. And so when nature calls, they usually just go. And so, Answer. yeah. It's great. I think, and we've had that happen a couple of times because uh, you've been here so often. But yeah, just a, yeah. It's a numbers game. Yeah. At some point, you're going to get pooped on. Right. All right, uh, we got more microphones in the room. Next question's right here. Hi. Hi. Out of curiosity, do you have any pets at home of your own? And do you, is it ever at all remotely possible for them to like interact, maybe with like a barrier between them, but like with these guys? Um, well, yes, I do have pets. Um, I think that will come as no surprise to anyone. Um, <laughs> I have, I have regular old pets. I've got a dog and a cat. Um, I've got a little goldfish pond in my, in my backyard habitat. Um, and actually, I take it back a little bit. I do have um, some aquatic salamanders called axolotls. Um, and so I don't, yes, I don't, um, other than the dog and the cat, you know, the animals don't interact because it would be kind of dangerous for them to do that. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, so keeping wildlife separate from pets you know, there. Are, I mean, there are instances where domesticated animals can be companion animals for wildlife. You know, in captive situations, um, you know, you do see that sometimes. And um, you know, the famous example is um, dogs that are used in uh, with cheetahs in captivity. Yeah. And um, it's kind of a flip side of what happens in Africa, where you have dogs like Anatolian shepherds, which help keep uh, farmers' uh, uh, livestock safe from cheetahs. Well, in captivity, the same breed and other breeds are oftentimes paired with young cheetahs, and the cheetahs kind of are relaxed by the dogs. I mean, it's, it makes sense, right? I mean, a big, cuddly dog, because the cheetahs are a little bit more skittish. So, But for the most part, wildlife and pets don't mix, and we should try to keep them separate. Yeah. Great question. Uh, I believe we have time for one more. It looks like all the way in the back on our red couch. Hi. Um, so you'd mentioned briefly earlier about how lawns are a big, like kind of detrimental to um, wildlife. So I'm curious, since America has such a big lawn culture, like yeah. how do you, what do you think is the way to combat something like that? Well, you'll have to have me back to answer that question. Yeah, because that's, that's it's, a full it's, episode, it's a isn't big, it? It's a big topic. Um, you know, my, my belief and what the National Wildlife Federation tries to do is kind of meet people where they are. Like, I'm never going to convince, you know, your next door neighbor who's out there with the pristine lawn and tons of chemicals and watering it that they should just not have a lawn, right? Yeah. So um, in an ideal world, we wouldn't have lawns. It would be much better for the planet and for wildlife. But so we try to meet people where they are. Um, what I always do is try to encourage people to make a goal, make every spring to add like a new garden bed and plant some native wildflowers. And, you know... It, Again, we're not going to get rid of every piece of lawn, but at least maybe we'll start to minimize it. And when people start planting these beautiful flowers, and then the hummingbirds and the bees and the butterflies start showing up and the birds, it can be a really powerful, much more powerful way than me preaching at them, mm -hmm. way of convincing them, oh, yeah, maybe I do want to get rid of a little bit of my lawn. I mean, there's all sorts of stats that you can find out there about, you know, we have more, uh, lawn is the single biggest crop in North America. There's more land really? planted in lawn than any other crop that, the, that humans plant. Um, horrible statistics about runoff and, and how lawns are really contributing to the degradation of our waterways in this country. Um, not to mention, you know, just like all the pesticides that get poured on them. Um, so it, again, the strategy is, as I was saying earlier, trying to meet people in a positive way where they are and give them positive motivation on doing the right thing than just preaching at them and throwing a bunch of stats and statistics at them. Um, and I mean, we have to do both of those things, but that's, that's what the Garden for Wildlife program is all about. It's trying to teach people 
fun, easy ways that they can make a difference for wildlife. And when they see the result of it, like that's way more powerful. I think I think he's ready. Yeah, yeah. way more powerful. <laughs> Thanks, Jamie. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's way more powerful than, again, getting on a soapbox. So, uh, But yeah, if you want more information on that, and anybody else out there, uh, Garden for Wildlife, it's on the National Wildlife Federation website, which is nwf.org. And if you just do backslash garden, uh, you can get tons more info. Awesome. That's a great question. Thank you so much for that. Thank you, everyone, for hanging out with us. Uh, Dave, before you get out of here, when you were here last, uh, we talked about uh, you know bees, and we had like the bee houses. As we enter this, the fall season, uh, you mentioned a lot of great springtime things. Mm -hmm. Are there some great fall time things that we can do to help contribute, yes. to help conserve? Well, two things. One is fall is actually the best time to plant trees and shrubs and perennials. Okay. So if you want to get into the wildlife garden thing for you help the birds and the butterflies and the bees, now's a, good now's time. a great time to be planting. And the other big tip that I can give, and it's actually related to the lawn question, is don't rake up your leaves. Leaves mm. are habitat. Leaves are natural fertilizer. Right? Think about it. We rake up all the leaves and we throw them away and then we go to the store and we buy mulch and we buy fertilizer, hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, Mother Nature just gave you that, right? So you, know, you don't have to leave them where they lie. You can rake them into your garden beds. You can use a mulching mower and chop them up. Um, you know, but just don't put them in the landfill. Yeah. If they go to the landfill, they break down, they, um, they release methane, which is one of our worst greenhouse gases. So, so don't do that. Compost them. If you have a municipal program um, that will pick them up and compost them and then give that back to you as a fertilizer and a mulch, you can do that. But um, yeah, there's a lot of animals that rely on the leaf layer huh. for habitat, and um, including some butterflies that overwinter in that leaf layer as pupa. Right? No, well. Yeah, chipmunks, salamanders, frogs, and toads, they all rely on the leaf layer. Wow. So if you can keep some of those leaves on the ground this fall, you'll be doing the wildlife a big favor. Oh, those are fantastic tips. Uh, that was awesome. Everybody, I know we're super hyped after that, but I'm going to remind you, as we do applaud to thank David, keep it at an appropriate volume so we don't frighten our little friends. But uh, nwf.org. I can't wait till you come back again. It is always so awesome when you come and hang out with us. Uh, David Mizajewski, everybody, please make a great little, yeah, golf claps. Golf Thanks, claps. guys. Thank you so much.